if we want to be able to scale connects and I guess now chain abstraction, this broader ecosystem to every chain, we need to find some way to make rebalancing actually economical and make it as passive as possible. We think from our perspective with what we see today, if we are able to solve this core problem, this benefit ends up trickling up the stack, right? So if you solve this for solvers, then intent solvers are able to provide better pricing. They can go to more chains, they can support more assets. If intent solvers can do that, then the intent protocols can do that. If the intent protocols can do that, that means every single application, every single chain, every single asset can eventually be accessed in a chain abstracted way. That's the, that's the Everclear thesis. Welcome to the Edge Podcast. I'm DeFi Dad here with Nomadic from 4RC. Today's show spotlights the launch of the first clearing layer by the newly rebranded Connects protocol called Everclear. In this episode, we discuss how Everclear aims to power chain abstraction, coordinate the global settlement of liquidity between chains, and solve fragmentation for modular blockchains. But before we do, just a quick word from our sponsors who make the Edge podcast possible. Introducing Flat Money, the first decentralized delta neutral flat coin built on base with sustainable yield that's completely untethered from legacy finance. Because DeFi needs an uncensorable base unit of currency. You can mint unit with RETH, which is held in the protocol's shared liquidity pool, where it's borrowed by leveraged traders. As a leveraged trader, you can deposit your margin collateral and go long on RETH. If you're trading in the perpetual futures market, you'll pay unit holders to open leverage positions. If you're holding unit, you'll earn yield from liquidations, borrow rate, and trading fees. Preserve your purchasing power and offset your exposure to crypto market volatility. Learn more at flat.money. Power up your portfolio by borrowing, lending, and multiplying your favorite assets. Made safe and easy by the industry-leading automation tools at Summer.Fi. Summer.Fi offers a curated DeFi experience to access the highest quality protocols and strategies. Discover new earned strategies for your portfolio in a user-friendly app designed to filter based on the tokens you hold, the networks you transact on, the protocols you trust, and the highest available yields. Learn more today at summer.fi, the best place to borrow and earn in DeFi. Tired of hopping between tabs, searching for new tokens before the hype catches on? Try Matcha.xyz, the DEX aggregator from 0x. Matcha connects hundreds of DEXs so you can trade millions of tokens and find fresh new drops. Matcha works out the best route to save you money on every trade. Swaps are free and Matcha has everything you need to trade on-chain. Gasless swaps, limit orders, and cross-chain, all in one place. Search trade done at matcha.xyz. Introducing the Mantle Liquid Staking Protocol, Mantle LSP, a permissionless, non-custodial, ETH liquid staking protocol deployed on Ethereum L1 and governed by Mantle. With Mantle LSP, users can stake ETH to instantly receive ME, earn yield and accumulate rewards the longer you stake. METH is the value accumulating receipt token that will give you access to expanded yield opportunities. Stake and watch your yield grow with Mantle LSP. It all started so simply with CryptoKitties and Maker on Ethereum, but quickly became complex with more applications and many chains. Today, everyone agrees UX issues are the biggest blocker standing in the way of crypto adoption. Introducing Avocado. Multi-chain UX redesigned from the ground up. The first wallet to abstract networks, accounts and gas. One gas tank to pay transaction fees on all chains in USDC and native access to Instadap's powerful custom DeFi strategies. Avocado, one wallet to rule all chains. All right, let's introduce Arjun Bhuptani, the co-founder of Connects Protocol. Arjun, welcome to the Edge podcast. How are you doing? Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. So there is a launch for a newly rebranded Connects Protocol called Everclear. And part of what we're going to talk about today is how Ever, Everclear aims to address the modular fragmentation problem, um, specifically as it relates to the thousands of L2s and app chains that uh, will be live in the coming years. Um, Everclear will introduce something called the clearing layer, which, again, we'll talk more about in just a few minutes. 
Arjun, you were one of the first DeFi uh, founders that I met back in like 2018. Um, you've always been a few years ahead of of every trend that that you know you could call out in DeFi. I feel like you were thinking about bridges when there was really nothing to bridge to. If you can kind of just share the highlights reel of you know all the work you've done over the years and and uh, what you initially set out to build with Connects Protocol. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I first joined this space back in 2017, uh, actually 2016. Sorry. Um, I had a background in physics and I was uh, kind of just stumbled into crypto just because I was um, really interested at the time in like different challenges associated with how like this, the the like technology acceleration is a world that we're headed towards. Um, things like what happens if one company owns all of all, like AGI, you know, how, how do we manage that? Um, and I, I at the time really started thinking about like it would be really awesome if we could build better like just public goods, digitally native public goods like the Internet that are not owned by any country, not owned by any government. And very luckily, I just happened to meet somebody that introduced me to Ethereum at the time. Um, I think pretty much right away, I was I was like, it, the, right away, I just knew that this was what I needed to be doing. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I started building infrastructure in the space. Um, I helped kind of uh, co-start the um, SF Ethereum developers meetup uh, back in 2016, 2017. And then in through that meetup, I kind of realized, well, all the projects that we were that were kind of talking there had a, had a similar set of problems around not really knowing how they were going to go and like onboard normal retail users who don't know anything about ETH, who don't know how to get on like uh, to use blockchains at all. So we um, at the time we I kind of started Connext with this thesis of like let's figure out how to scale Ethereum, let's figure out how to scale adoption of this technology to as many people as possible. Because if we can do that, that can be kind of like the the first domino that can that can topple that can let us solve all of these other deeper societal issues down the road. Um, uh, I think that has it's been a pretty wild ride. We ended up kind of we just basically caught, constantly drawn ourselves towards whatever the hardest problems are that are stopping us from getting adoption. And so pretty quickly that that was that was scalability, right? In 2017, 2018, like the Ethereum blockchain was completely unusable. Um, and so Connects became one of the first scalability L2 like R&D teams in the space. Um, I think I'm pretty sure we built one of the first L2s, if not the first L2, uh, that was kind of like general purpose, not specifically targeted an application. Um, and uh, uh, and then from there, we kind of started working with a lot of the other L2 research teams. Um, and the and like we saw the research was heading heading towards rollups. And around 2020, we realized okay, there's a there's a huge problem here where there's all of these fantastic teams building rollups. Everyone at the time was like, well, there's going to be one L2 that will there will be one L2 for Ethereum in the same way that Lightning was the L2 for Bitcoin. Um, and we just didn't really see a way for that to happen. There were too many awesome teams funded by too many VCs. And like we kind of realized there was going to be this problem where like users were going to have to be able to figure out how to get into rollups, out of rollups, in between rollups as quickly as possible. Um, and so in 2020, we started, we built this like demo um, called Spacefold that used a technology at the time called State Channels, uh, which you can think of as like a proto intent, um, uh, used a technology called State Channels to send tokens between between rollups. Um, and uh, and we didn't realize it at the time, but this was actually something that like was just on the cusp of becoming an extraordinarily big problem. Because later that year, uh, basically at the end of 2020, start of 2021, was when like uh, the space started to take off. Polygon and Bidens chain happened. Um, and all of a sudden, this like rinky dink bridge that we had built we didn't even really know what to call it um it just became called by a bridge by by people this rinky dink little thing that we built um basically using intents ended up scaling massively um and, uh, and of course it broke all the time but all of a sudden there was just a ton of people that needed this um since then we've been pri- primarily focused on this problem this this core problem of like how do we make it possible for users to not have to care what chain they're on um how can we get to the point where everything just feels like a single ecosystem right you how can we how can we get to the point where using a web3 application is like using youtube where you don't have to understand google's distributed database infrastructure behind the scenes in order to actually watch cat videos you could just watch them um i think that's that's pretty much where we are today so arjun with all of with all of that you're you're rebranding to everclear and from what i've kind of gathered you know talking to you a bit offline this is a completely net new primitive you're introducing um, just kind of curious, like how long have you been working on this problem? Because it kind of seems like you're just coming out of nowhere with this, but yeah, just kind of curious behind the scenes, how long have this, has this been baking, I guess? For sure. Um, 
So we'll we'll get into a little bit more details around like why Everclear exists and what the kind of core core ethos behind it is and what problem it specifically solves. Um, but the 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 desire to build something like Everclear came out of our initial work with building one of the first intent based bridges back in 2021. Um, when we launched Connects V0 and then eventually Connects V1 in 2021, we realized we were using solvers, so like third party service providers that were going and providing liquidity on on uh, on whatever chain the user wanted to get to. Um, we we were using these solvers. We realized all of these solvers had a set of shared problems around how they rebalanced liquidity between chains. Um, and what we realized was like, well, the vast majority of people that were doing, so we had like $50 million in TBL. The vast majority of the TBL, I think it was like, like 90 plus percent, maybe even 95% was just sitting on the sidelines, not really being used. And it was because the the people that were operating these solvers at the time we called them routers were just not like, didn't have the operational capacity to go and like move their funds between chains because the the kind of inherent limitation of these intent based bridges was you know if i am if i'm you know if i'm making a transaction from arbitrum to optimism um and and you are like a, a solver that is giving liquidity on arbitrum when i i you know send like 100,000 usdc on on optimism and you give me 100,000 usdc on arbitrum you get my, you basically unlock funds back on optimism so you're we're effectively like swapping places with each other um and in order to get back to your original state you have to rebalance um we've basically been banging our heads against that problem of how do we make it very economical for solvers to rebalance now for three years and in in the last like i would say six months or so we had this huge internal breakthrough where we realized this is such an incredibly big problem and especially as this this space is starting to like move towards like intent centricism and intent-based bridges, intent-based texts, et cetera, we realize this is such a big problem that it's going to be a problem for everybody, not just us. Arjun, I think this is a good place for us to like pivot more into just like what is Everclear then? Like how does it address some of the the problems, you know, you've talked about as it relates to fragmentation and I, I'm I'm like really keen to learn like how does this differ from you know, existing cross-chain solutions? So the core problem that Everclear aims to solve is fragmentation, right? Everybody in this space knows about the fragmentation problem. You have funds all over, um, on every chain. Um, you have this like really, really awful experience where you need to go and bridge to chains in order to use applications. And this this whole this whole situation is just getting worse and worse, right? We, we will end up in a world with hundreds or thousands of chains. There's no clear answer as to how we're going to be able to get tokens everywhere at the moment. Uh, and how we're going to be able to do that at scale economically in a way where users are not like tearing their hair out. Um, the, the last year we we introduced this idea of chain abstraction, um, and it, for from our side it was it was really a vision, right? We we sort of saw that there was this like shared set of problems that everybody was having, and we we realized that the the outcome, we, like the space, kind of needs a north star, which is like, what do we actually want to build for? And so we define chain abstraction as users should never need to know what chain they're on. Um, it's not a very like complex thesis. It's very, very like simple vision. I think that's part of what makes it really powerful is that like for most people, for pretty much everybody in the space, like that resonates, right? You're like, yeah, of course it makes sense. It's not going to, it's, it's kind of ridiculous for every user to know what chain they're on. So how do we do that? Um, for the past few years, and I think many, many more projects are now starting to like wake up to this. Um, we, there's a growing ecosystem being built around chain abstraction. Um, and all of it is centered around this notion of intense, um, so for the past few years, we've been experimenting with this concept of intents. Intents are a design approach where instead of a user having to go and deal with all the nitty gritty details of making transactions between chains or really any other kinds of transactions in the space, they can offload that complexity to service providers, to like third parties. Basically, it's like a, a good example of an intent-based system is to think of something like Uber or a TaskRabbit, right? Um, when you t- when you call an Uber today, it, like what what is Uber doing? It's abstracting away the experience of you having to go find a driver to get you from point A to point B. You express this desire that I want to go to this destination, and Uber finds you the person who can get you there as cheaply and quickly as possible. That's basically an intent. Um, I think there's a, a lot of information out there around intents, but I hope that this kind of helps make it a lot simpler for people. Um, intents work, right? Like you can look at across today but across this bridge is in- incredible it's a, it's a fantastic experience because specifically because um you know you're you're removing away all the complexity of interacting with chains and instead there's this across the solvers are the ones that are doing it however intents are limited 
Um, and the, the way that they're limited is something that I think people, not a lot of people know about yet. Um, every single intent-based bridge that exists today is like super centralized. Um, this includes Connects as well, or I guess now Everclear. Um, and the reason for this is just that there's there's some like inherent limitations to how you can actually send funds very economically between chains. So as I mentioned earlier, um, there is there is like as a solver, as a person that's making transactions happen between chains, you have to rebalance your capital. Uh, rebalance your capital ca- costs money, right? You're 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 kind of shifting the complexity of bridging and of, of managing things over to this other third party, but that complexity isn't gone. Uh, so if if I'm a solver, when I make transactions happen across chains, I have to continually figure out how, like, which bridge should I use, which sex should I use, which OTC desk should I use to get my funds back where they belong. In practice, this is super hard to do, right? Like, if you're an indie solver, if you're an individual person that's just running some infrastructure with some liquidity in it, you're not going to be able to do this as well as someone like Wintermute, uh, right? Like, there's huge economies of scale here where, like, if you have lot, if you have hundreds of millions of dollars in capital, you could do this way more op- optimally than any indie, indie user can. And we see this today. Like when you look at the solver ecosystems of all of these intent-based bridges and even even the DEXs. I mean, the DEXs are a bit better because they're on a single chain, but as soon as they go across chains, the same same problem exists. When you look at those ecosystems, you find that they're super, super centralized. Um, this was the core problem we encountered in 2021. Uh, we realized there, if we want to be able to scale Connects, I guess now chain abstraction, this broader ecosystem to every chain, we need to find some way to make rebalancing actually economical and make it as passive as possible. This is kind of where clearing comes in. So we started examining more generally what's going on in the space. What ana- like what analogous kind of systems exist outside of crypto um, in traditional finance, in like, you know, payments, things like that. What we realized is that this isn't a new problem. Like people have to coordinate the settlement of funds at scale on a global scale all the time in other kinds of financial systems, right? Uh, in in like with when you're when you're using like Visa to make card payments, for example, Visa immediately makes the transaction happen. They like execute the transaction with with the merchant, like if, if you're buying coffee, for example. And then behind the scenes, they're the ones that go and like coordinate the process of getting settlement, getting like your transaction settled to a bank. And while they're doing that, what they're doing is something called netting. They're basically saying, oh, there are a ton of transactions that go between like Bank of America and Chase every day. There is no reason for us to send like a million dollars here and then a million dollars here. Effectively, it's the same as just sending zero dollars. Um, when we started thinking about that, we looked into, well, what does the global flow of funds actually look like between Chase today? And that's where we saw something extremely interesting. On average, 80% of the funds that flow between chains today net out. That's kind of insane. That basically means that like for every dollar that you're sending into Arbitrum on average, 80 cents are getting sent out uh, within like a 24 hour period. In a nutshell, this basically means that people are bridging and sending funds between chains about five times more than they actually need to be. Uh, this whole space is like really bottlenecked because everyone is has this like local view of their liquidity, right? Everyone is trying to rebalance. This is intense solvers, but if you if you kind of like if you ask the intent solvers what they're doing, they're working with market makers. You ask them, you know, the market makers are also rebalancing. You ask the market makers what they're doing, they're working with centralized exchanges who are also rebalancing. And so eventually, like, the buck kind of stops and you realize, well, everyone is playing this, like, isolated game. Um, everyone is playing this, like, PVP game where they all are rebalancing their own funds. They're all thinking about how to get their own capital between chains. But they're not working with each other. This was the kind of key insight that led to Everclear and to, to this idea of a clearing layer. So what is a clearing layer? The clearing layer is a system that helps to coordinate the global setting, settlement and netting of funds between chains. What this means is a clearing layer allows like all three of us, for example, to say, hey, we all want, like I have funds on Optimism, uh, you have funds on Arbitrum, you have funds on DKC. We are all going to coordinate with each other to settle onto each other's funds. That way we don't have to each go and rebalance our own capital. Um, I think... Uh, this kind of leads to to like Everclear and what Everclear does. So Everclear is specifically the first clearing layer. And Everclear coordinates the global settlement of liquidity between chains, solving modular fragmentation. We think from our perspective with what we see today, if we are able to solve this core problem, this benefit ends up trickling up the stack, right? So if you solve this for solvers, then intent solvers are able to provide better pricing. They can go to more chains. They can support more assets. 
If intent solvers can do that, then the intent protocols can do that. If the intent protocols can do that, that means every single application, every single chain, every single asset can eventually be accessed in a chain abstracted way. That's the that's the Everclear thesis. One follow up to to everything you had to share is, what would you say to someone who says that Ethereum is kind of like a, a clearing layer, but obviously it's there's a bottleneck there because of the way that uh, because of the way that crypto assets move between L twos and eventually L threes and and something like an Ethereum. Um, I recognize the value that Everclear is bringing, and I guess like. I guess, like, are there drawbacks to consider with this? Like, obviously, like, you're introducing another layer. And so I, I would imagine there's going to be challenges to, like, uh, ensure that it is, like, decentralized enough that users can, you know, trust that it will be uncensorable. And um, so, yeah, anyways, any thoughts on that? So I guess kind of going through those questions in turn, um, is Ethereum a clearing layer itself? Um, I would argue no. And, and this kind of gets into the definition of clearing, right? So in historically, the way that you define clearing um, outside of crypto and in general is everything that happens between when a, transa- when a transaction is executed to when it is settled. Um, you can think of this like in a rollup context, right? So a transaction gets executed on the rollup and then eventually the rollup posts the batch to Ethereum. Um, Rollups and, and in fact, the, the way that rollups, so technically speaking, shared sequencers of rollups, right, would be clearing. But what they're clearing is technically block space. It's not. It's not. It's not money. Um, uh, or it's not in this case order flow. Um, I would say Ethereum is more like falls into the settlement camp because that ultimately is the point at which a user is getting funds or a solver or market maker is getting funds, right? And at that point, their interaction with this full transaction is complete. Arjun, there's kind of like a a ton of things coming to mind as you were um, walking through that earlier bit. Um, And and mainly it's just like, how does this impact market participants right now? And like thinking through a bunch of different market participants, you, you mentioned solvers, which I think if you could even just give maybe like a high level definition of what a solver is. I, I'm sure we've talked about that on this podcast before, but I think that'd be helpful. Um, but then like further to that, just, you know, how does this impact other intense projects, market makers? You mentioned Wintermute, who's essentially a solver market maker themselves, other centralized exchanges, basically kind of the holistic stack of market participants, like what you're bringing into the ecosystem how will they need to like bend around this or work with this? You know what I mean? For sure. Um, so what, what is a solver? Um, a solver is basically anyone that is filling in pets. And by that, I mean a, a service provider that is going and doing things on behalf of a user in order to earn fees. What they're doing is, is actually pretty open. The term is like we come up with a lot of terms to represent this role. But it, if you kind of squint and look at look at look throughout the space, you realize there's a bunch of things that are already solvers um, and that are that are performing the same role, but for slightly different needs and slightly different purposes, right? So meta transaction relayers are, are solvers. Like what they're doing is they're relaying a transaction to chain on behalf of the user, um, potentially paying gas. Like so gas abstraction uses solvers. Um, uh, you know, uh, EIP 4337, like paymasters uh, and and like the, the people that relay, relay like those transactions are, are, are solvers. Um, like intent-based bridges, the people that are making your transaction happen on the target chain are solvers. Uh, as I mentioned, Uber drivers are solvers, right? Um, uh, now, how does how does this kind of affect the the full market? Um, what we kind of realized is like this definition of solvers is uh, people's understanding of solvers right now is quite limited, but it's a role that is actually very important in the space, and it's, and it's really it's growing extraordinarily quickly. Um, generally speaking. What we're saying here is that there is a set of parties that need to like provide liquidity on a target chain if you want to be able to do chain abstracted stuff. Where that liquidity comes from is the open question. If those participants are providing their own liquidity and are having to rebalance it between chains, then they're going to somebody else to figure out how to do that, right? They're going to a bridge or they're going to a market maker or going to a centralized exchange. And so what we saw is like this core problem of fragmentation where people people need to figure out how to move liquidity between chains as optimally as possible. Um, is actually shared by everybody. Um, every single market participant today deals with this in a slightly different way. So like, for example, new chains have to go and figure out how to generate enough hype to get like 
you know, bridges to deploy there and to build liquidity there and to ideally get centralized exchange integrations. And in practice, only like the top five to 10% of, of chains are able to do this. Applications have to go on like copy paste to each chain because they don't know how to like, they, there's no easy way to get, get users to bridge to, to whatever chain they're on all the time. DeFi enables a whole new world of trading and yield opportunities. Sometimes we all wish we had a little bit bigger of a budget so we can make the most out of it. That's why we created Blueberry. Blueberry lets you access the best opportunities on Ethereum all in one easy to use terminal. You can access 5X, 10X, or even 20X your money in one click, more than any other lending market, so you can maximize your earnings only on Blueberry. Arjun, how do you ensure that the clearing layer is decentralized? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. So you can think of the clearing layer as a like computer to coordinate settlements between a bunch of different market actors, right? Market actors that were previously like isolated and adversarial with each other. So like market makers, centralized exchanges, solvers, LPs, arbitragers, like people, basically anybody that is sending large amounts of value between chains and needs it like doesn't care necessarily how how long it takes but needs it to happen as efficiently as possible um in order for the system to work and to do what it says it does it needs to have a couple of properties so one it it as you mentioned it needs to be censorship resistant um uh it needs to you know ideally be in a, in a position where like uh, like it's it's effectively unstoppable um uh, long term i think that's it's extremely important and then two it needs to be like verifiable uh, right so if you're running some logic on the system, like these are all adversarial actors. No one is going to trust that someone is doing the job correctly. Um, this is very, very counter to like like clearing houses. So we, we sort of say clearing layers are very different from clearing houses because clearing houses in traditional finance are like custodial and they're like a central actor and you trust them explicitly to do the job right. Right. So like the New York Stock Exchange, you trust that the New York Stock Exchange is going to like settle everybody correctly. And if, if they don't do it, that would be a huge, huge, huge problem. Um, with clearing layers, we get that guarantee crypto economically. Um, the way that we do that is that the clearing layer is a rollup. Um, it's it's quite literally an arbitrum orbit rollup. Um, Everclear is all of the logic that Everclear runs is deployed as smart contracts on top of the rollup. And if Everclear cheats, so it misorders settlements, right? Um, like it it, allo- it like preferentially settles Alice over Bob because it just wants to give m- more money to Alice then that's provable on chain and, and provable as part of like the rollup fraud proof and you can slash the rollup for it. How does it get decentralized? Uh, there's there's certain aspects of that I think that that like happen at different paces. So like the ultimate level of decentralization this gets to is like having, uh, you know, decentralized sequencing for the actual arbitrum orbit rollup. I think this space is heading that direction and that's that's like the ultimate outcome we want to head towards as well. Uh, but in the meantime, for our practical perspective, there's also like things like you know, ensuring that there's like sufficient security for the system and ensuring that, you know, there's there's no way for um, for like uh, attackers to be able to like like uh, for like create, you know, fake ways to like settle funds or like incomplete ways to settle funds or inaccurate ways to settle funds. Uh, for that, the system is basically using Eigenlayer for security. Um, now, naturally, at launch, the Eigenlayer will not have uh, slashing enabled. This is something that we are like working uh, we're chatting with them about this is something that we're like keenly like waiting for. Um, I think in the meantime, we're working with to see like what are the best options for each chain that we connect to. Um, and so I think the the goal there is like uh, out of the gate, we're working really closely with Hyperlane because their their approach towards like having modular security means we could use the best system that is available and then eventually upgrade it into like an eigen there ABS. Um, and so there's th- those are kind of the three stages. Like stage one, provide odd proofs and provide this guarantee that things will happen correctly. Stage two, provide the economic security and, and like not just like hand wavy, oh, this is this is secured by something, but here is, you know, X billion dollars of capital that is securing these the the like funds, the messages that are being sent from the system out to any chain. And then three, decentralized sequencing. So the system is completely unstoppable. So Archin, let's assume uh, the clearing layer is live. You've worked through all these these phases. Um, can you tell us like what changes in the user experience for us as like folks that would be like normally bridging value between like Ethereum and L2s and and other rollups? Um, also, if if there's any like use cases that you have thought of being unlocked by all of this, like what what are you excited about? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I think there's a there's a few things, right? So like the the core problem 
the core thing that we're solving is this this singular root problem that underlies chain abstraction, which is like we there are tons and tons of projects today that are building in the chain abstraction stack. And there's a there's a stack that's kind of emerging that we've talked about as part of the announcement. Um, that stack includes projects like, you know, intent based bridges, things like like across um, intent based DEXs like Uniswap X. And that behind the scenes includes things like order flow auctions, like what Socket is doing with with their modular order flow auction system. Um, and then after that includes like solver networks, things like Enzo or Kalani that are that are trying to make solving um, like easier for for everybody or make it have like a standardized implementation for solving. All of these players really massively benefit from the clearing there and from Everclear um, because all of these players and and it's, we really just trickles kind of up the stack. Like all of these players get see much much better pricing, much much better performance, and a much broader access to ecos like a much broader ecosystem of solvers they can work with when you have solvers able to like operate totally passively without having to like think about rebalancing and without having to pay lots of money for rebalancing. So when you trickle up to, to the top, what does this mean? This means a few things. One, um, being able to get to this like theoretical end state that we want to get to a chain abstraction where like I'm able to, you know, use Aave, like I, I can go and use Aave, uh, you know, deploy it on Aave chain when that goes live. I'm able to go and use Aave from any chain. Um, it happens in a single transaction. I don't even need to know what's happening. It doesn't matter where my funds are. It doesn't matter where Aave chain is. It doesn't matter. None of the other surrounding infrastructure matters. I'm just able to go and use the app. That's that's one really, really key unlock. And it's probably the biggest thing that we're excited about. Beyond that, I think there's a few other things. Um, for chains, it means like, we, we really believe this in this idea of like rollups of the new server. Uh, this is obviously a meme that's been going around, and I think it's I think it's 100 percent right. It's been something that we've been thinking about for years. Where like eventually the way that we will build applications on the internet will be as rollups. It would be completely useless if your role, if your server on day one didn't come connected to the internet. Um, and that's how we think about this. Is like it's like you need you need liquidity from day one. You need access to the rest of the interchain from day one if you want your like L3 game to be successful. Um, that is a massive unlock here is like for for every chain out of the gate everclear can be permissionlessly deployed there and it acts as a foundation so on top of this liquidity foundation you can have bridges you can have intent protocols you can have dexes you can have everything else that kind of gets built and comes along with that um and then i think the last thing is 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 basically like moving towards a world where we can have just more seamless uh just a more seamless experience for everybody for for managing liquidity um like for example, centralized exchanges, right? Like the notion that centralized exchanges today are just only able to support a small subset of chains, but not others is, is quite bizarre for users, right? Like it's a, it's an, ex, it's extreme challenge to be able to go and onboard as a new user to some random chain. if like finance isn't supported there. Um, this is an unlock for this, for those centralized exchanges where centralized exchanges can take their existing liquidity sitting on a single chain and they can allow deposits and users from literally every single other chain. Um, and this can happen in a very, very economical way. Um, I would say aside from that, like there's a few other things that we're super excited about. Um, so one one thing that I kind of touched on was that like this system is a rollup, right? And and it is literally a sim- sim- like an EDM compatible rollup. The system's contracts live as smart like Solidity smart contracts on the rollup. And the approach that the system has towards how it nets and settle funds is also modular. Uh, so this is actually something that's like very, very interesting because what it means is uh, maybe maybe taking a step back, right? Like how is how does the system actually work? Well, whenever anybody wants to move funds between chains or wants to say like settle settle like a uh, an intent or something like that between chains, they prove to the system that that there is an intent that exists or that there are funds deposited into the system. Everclear issues an invoice effectively. Um, an invoice basically represents an IOU from Everclear to whatever user that there is that there is a certain amount of funds that they they need to be that they need to receive and the user can define how and when they want to receive those funds so for example um if i'm a market maker i could say i'm fine with settling to any of like arbitrum optimism or zk sync and the system when it when it has this invoice will figure out okay is there enough liquidity is there enough deposits in the system is there enough like transfer flow going from these other chains where i could just settle you know 100k of liquidity into into these chains uh, now, what's really interesting about this is that this notion of having invoices that represent flows of funds between chains is itself financializable, is itself something that people can build on top of. This is an entirely new type of DeFi primitive as well, uh, because it basically means you can build and like like 
things like lending protocols that 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 allow people to give immediate liquidity to a salt or a market maker or even a centralized exchange in order to earn some fees. Um, you could build a way for people to trade these invoices. You could build ways for people to speculate on these invoices or build like perps on top of these invoices. Uh, this actually really, really matches to how things work in the traditional financial ecosystem as well. Like uh, when you have pending invoices that like need to be settled, uh, businesses or financial actors will sell those or rehypothecate those all the time because it's a way to get like extra liquidity. It's a way to like improve the economics of whatever it is that you're doing. So there's a there's this like really, really interesting inefficiency that exists in the market today that like we can build an entirely innovative DeFi ecosystem on top of. Arjun, I'm just like, my brain is kind of running wild here with questions. I'm, I'm going to try to just hit, hit you with one at a time here, but um, I'm curious, like, just like hypothetically, you go live with this in mainnet and how do you secure, um, I guess like you, a lot of your users will be almost like B2B uh, to begin with, I'd, I'd imagine, but like, how do you go to market with kind of like buy-in? Is it like, the efficiency of what you're building is like speaks for itself. Are you are you in the background doing a lot of BD? Like, you know, are are you engaging with discussions with all these chains and different players already? Are you going to be rolling out incentives to get people to kind of opt into this? Um, and I hate to throw throw like multiple questions at you, but I'm going to do it. Um, just kind of like walking through the UI of this, I'm curious. Like, this almost seems like something that should be embedded in a wallet. Or something like I, I don't know how you're thinking of like I'm trying to visualize how this will look ultimately as a user, right? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so you know, how how does how does this actually get adoption? How does this win? Um, I think I think it's kind of what you said. It's like a lot of BD. And it's a lot of coordination work. Um, we've been super fortunate in that. I think there's there's a, there's a few things that are really awesome about this. First is that I think we are just by way of being the first people to really think about these problems and, and to start working on these problems and researching them, I think we're at the moment the only project that's actually working on this. Um, because we've discovered that there is this like key unlock associated with with clearing that people have just not realized at all yet. Um, I think that that helps a lot. Um, beyond that, I think this is a this is also like a really interesting interesting system where there, it's very, very rare in, in both crypto and outside of crypto where you have a system where everybody's incentives are actually very positively aligned. For every new user of the system, there is like a benefit to join the system because simply by joining and simply by using the system, you're not only improving your own pricing and your own settlement, but you're doing it for everybody else that's in the system. And so there's sort of this like effect where everyone that we've gone and talked to has basically said like, yeah, this is actually really important and we need this. Like, there's no other solution in the market and this seems super positive some and i think that's a big part of our approach here is like uh, it's a big part of the reason for the rebrand is like we realize this needs to be its own thing and it needs to be this like very open neutral thing where we try to work as much as possible with other ecosystems or work as much as possible with other projects so a big part of what we're doing today is like working to try to build relationships with and support every single chain abstraction ecosystem that we can um and uh, or every single chain abstraction project that we can because we think that this is this is really like how both Everclear wins and then the space more broadly wins. Um, now, how does this how does this work in the user? How does this get get integrated to something that that like a user would encounter or interact with? Um, for a user, the hope is I mean it's, it's kind of similar to something like shared sequencing, right? Where ideally, if shared sequencing exists and it, it exists and is being done really well, the users just never need to know that it's happening. That's the end state that we would like to get to. Um, I think it's otherwise it's, it's kind of similar to something like 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 Visa, right? As a user, you never need to really understand what Visa is doing behind the scenes um, to in order to get the benefit of it. I think for a user that's using a wallet or using an application today, what will happen is the user will end up interacting with an intent based protocol. They'll have a really really seamless experience. They won't even really realize that there's an intent based protocol behind the scenes, and that intent based protocol will settle using Nex or uh, using Everclear. Sorry. I still need to work uh, work through the rebrand myself as well. Arjun, for those that have been uh, users or been participants in Connects Protocol, I mean, what can you tell us about like this rebrand? Like, what does it mean to rebrand to Everclear? What does it mean for uh, you know the token itself? Like, how will this affect the DAO? A any details there you can share? Yeah, great question. Um, so part of it, so basically, the there's there's kind of rationale around the rebrand. Um, 
a big part of the rationale is that the Connects brand is now eight years old. Um, we've been doing stuff for a long time and we've been doing a lot of different things for a long time. And so I think that that can, that can kind of get confusing over time because you just have all of this like build up context. Um, the other big reason is that what we're doing now is this like fundamentally new thing, right? We're, we're operating at a, at the new, at a new level of the, this like new emerging chain abstraction stack and, and like the, which is part of the, the modular stack. Um, we're operating at this new level to do this new thing that just hasn't really existed. Um, and there's a few things that come with that. So like, we want to kind of make it very clear that this is, this is what Everclear is. It's like this very specific thing, the clearing layer. And we also want it to be like separated from, you know, the bridge and, and other pieces that, that are actually competitive with, with, with folks that would otherwise be Everclear's users, right? So for example, um, projects like Across, projects like Uniswap X, projects like Squid, Router, et cetera, they are all users of Everclear, but they're competitors of previously connects. Um, uh, so what we're doing is the Connects brand in general across the board is being sunset. Um, it will no longer exist. We're transitioning everything over to new brands. Um, Everclear is the new protocol. Um, it's this clearing layer protocol. The bridge UI and intent protocol that exists today will still exist. Uh, it will be largely sort of like the, the goal is for it to be largely a showcase because otherwise it would be competitive with other users in the Everclear ecosystem. And, uh, and that will be moved under the brand of Eversync. Um, and so if you go to like the Connects Bridge links today, you will all redirect to Eversync. If you go to like the, the kind of home kind of core protocol pages, that will redirect direct to Everclear. Um, now about the token and DAO, that's also a really, really great question. Um, everything from the token and DAO perspective is still the same. So the DAO, uh, the, the Connects DAO will now become the Everclear DAO. Everclear DAO will control the Everclear protocol and, and sort of like manage upgradability of it. And at least in the initial stages, manage some like critical allow listing things like chain expansion and, and asset support. Though eventually we want to make this permissionless. Um, and the next token will still be the token of the system. Um, it'll be like the core, a core piece of, you know, it'll be, still be used for voting within the, within the Everclear DAO. Um, and we we have some ideas around how it can become like a core piece of the Everclear system as well. In fact, it, it we think it's actually extremely necessary to to have the system operate at scale and work for every single chain and every single asset. Guys, I think this is a great place for us to wrap up. So I want to remind our listeners that they should learn more about Everclear at everclear.org. If you go to the oldconnects.network website, it'll just redirect to you. Uh, by the time this podcast is live, the Twitter handle should be rebranded to Everclear Org. Um, you'll find uh, all of that information in our show notes. And then um, also a reminder to follow Arjun on Twitter. It's just Arjun Bhuptani, his full name. And again, that'll be in our show notes. Arjun, thanks so much for com coming on and teaching us about uh, this new clearing layer through Everclear. Um, would love to just know, you know, what's next? Uh, like when is mainnet expected? As of this recording, the testnet should be live. So again, folks can play with that at everclear.org. But any other like call to action or recommendation for folks who want to get involved with Everclear? For sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. This has been an awesome conversation. And it's really it's like an amazing experience to be able to like talk about this stuff finally after having worked on it in, in silence for like months. Um, uh, what's next? So we're obviously now just getting like in the in the process of getting to mainnet uh we're targeting the the, the mainnet will kind of be rolled out in phases just because we want to have guardrails and things like that we talk about that in the in the launch post um we're targeting the alpha mainnet launch in early q3 and that's what we'll kind of be like working with live volume with certain limitations and things like that um uh and then uh as 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 you mentioned like today the test net is live and so I would say the main like call to action is for builders in the space that are building with intents. And I know that there are a ton of people that are doing that now. Um, come talk to us. Uh, if you're doing anything in that space, anything related to chain abstraction, we can, there's, there's like certain, like, even if we can't like directly solve problems, there's like a bunch of different tangential things that we'd love to like learn about from you. And also, also try to collaborate on because we, we really strongly feel like this is, this is like, as I mentioned earlier, like the incentives are super aligned here for everybody that's like working with the system. Um, and we want to try to make it as like neutral and open as possible for everyone. Thanks everyone for tuning in. If you're a talented founder or developer, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And for future episodes of the Edge podcast, please check out our link tree at edge underscore pod.